During this session, I'm going to be talking about the wave phenomena of polarization. Now, light normally tends to uh, oscillate across a number of different planes. As we can see here in the diagram on the left, we can see that this is typically unpolarized light. Now, once light passes through a polaroid, now a polaroid is a lens which only allows light to pass through, which is oscillating in a certain direction. What we get is known as polarized light. So in this case, I have my unpolarized beam, and then the polarized light we see is only oscillating in the vertical direction. Now, in this situation, if I put another polarized uh, polaroid lens there, another polarizer, and I put this at 90 degrees to my polarized light, which is polarized in the vertical direction, um, I managed to stop all of the light traveling through, and that means no light will be transmitted whatsoever. So let's think about this in a little bit more detail. We're thinking about putting some numbers behind what happens in these situations. So we'll think about the light intensity that passes through. Now, here I've got a situation similar to what I had in the first diagram, where I have what's known as the polarizer, and then I have the analyzer. Okay, so the analyzer allows me to look in detail about the light that has come through. These are terms which we're going to use in more detail a little bit later on when we're thinking about substances and how they can have an impact on the direction which light will be polarized. Now, first step, the polarizer, by definition of only letting light through in one direction, immediately halves the intensity of the light. So, from unpolarized to polarized light, we immediately half the intensity. Now, the light transmitted by the analyzer, uh, so this is polarized light, is completely dependent on the angle to the polarized light. So, the angle which the polarizer is with respect to the angle which the light is oscillating. This means, as I mentioned before, if the analyzer is at 90 degrees, uh, to the polarizer, it reduces the intensity down to zero. So that tells me about the extremes. Um, if I have at 90 degrees, then it drops down to zero. Let's first of all think about some numbers and actually that range of angles which we can place the analyzer. This comes down to what is known as a Malice's law. Okay. So Malice's law looks at how much. Uh, Oh, the uh, the amount of light which is transmitted, or the amount of polarized light which is transmitted when it goes through a further polarizer. So the transmitted amplitude is A O cos theta. So A O is the polarized amplitude, which is obviously half the original amplitude, and the angle theta is the measured angle between the angle which the polarized light is coming in at and the angle at which the polarizer allows light to come through. If we think about this further, um, we know that the intensity is related to amplitude squared. So we know about the transmitted amplitude. There's a relationship between the amplitude of light and intensity. So the intensity of the transmitted polarized light becomes uh, amplitude squared, so the intensity equals obviously um, a original squared cos squared theta and um, a original squared is actually the intensity of the original so we have uh, the intensity of the original light multiplied by cos squared theta tells us the intensity of the light which is um, intensity of polarized light which passes through another polaroid that's one bit of thinking there's another way in which light can be polarized. It doesn't necessarily have to be placed through a polaroid. What happens, uh, light can be polarized through reflection as well. What happens if we have an incident ray falling upon a surface? What happens is some of the light is refracted, so that be slightly polarized, but there's a specific angle of where the reflected ray is completely polarized light. Now we can work that angle out by thinking about this diagram and applying our understanding of refraction. So, to work out completely uh, the angle of completely polarized reflected light, 
First of all, from refraction, we recognize that n equals sine of the angle of incidence divided by sine of the angle of refraction. Remember, ein, n here would be the refractive index of the medium it's passing into, assuming that the uh, first medium is a vacuum or air, which is equivalent to having a refractive index of one, so it doesn't have an impact in this situation. Now, from the diagram, we can see that if we have the sine of the angle of incidence, um, if we look carefully and we want to work out what the angle of refraction is, we see that the reflected uh, ray is going to obviously have an angle of theta because the, in, the laws of reflection tell us that the angle of reflection is going to be equal to the angle of incidence. And we see that refracted light is going to be 90 degrees further around from the normal. So that tells me that sine theta e divided by sine 90 minus theta equals the refractive index. Now, a bit of mathematics here. We should recognize that sine 90 minus theta should be equal to sine theta divided by cos cosine theta, which is also equal to tan theta. That means that the refractive index of a material should be equal to the tan of the angle of which reflected light is completely polarized. And this becomes known as the Brewster's Law. So with that in mind, uh, let's think about a question which could be asked. At what angle would the light reflected from water be completely polarized? We're recognizing refractive index of water is 1.3. So we know that uh, the refractive index is equal to the tan of the angle of uh, totally polarized reflected light. So with the information I've got here, I can recognize the angle is going to be equal to 52 degrees. Now, in this case, I have to recognize that the angle uh, which we have is the angle from the normal. So to work out the angle from the C, I have to do 90 minus 52. So if you look at the surface of the water at 38 degrees, the light will be perfectly polarized. And this polarization of light, especially around uh, reflections from water, is one of the reasons why when you're on the beach or if you're working on, on a boat of some sort, having light uh, sunglasses which have a, a polaroid feature polarizing feature means it really reduces the glare and that could be really really useful in that situation. So let's think about some other practical purposes. First of all, this is a statement. Some substances are known to be optically active. Now an opti optically active substance rotates the polarization. So as polarized light passes through this substance it causes a rotation. This often happens in chiral mo molecules. So these are ones which have a left-handedness and right-handedness. And solids with a rotated crystal plane such as quartz. Now this is quite useful because if we uh, think about this, the amount of rotation of polarization that takes place gives us some idea about the substance. And that's exactly how this is used. So I can work out the concentration uh, of a substance by looking at how much it rotates polarization. We use something what's known as a, uh, a polarimeter and so it, uses, it measures the optical rotation of molecules in the solution. Um, what I have here is a basic formula. Uh, here I've got alpha is the um, optical rotation so that means how much the polarized light has been rotated around, what angle uh, we've got the specific optic rotation. So that means every substance which has this is an optically active substance tells you how many degrees the polarized, uh, the polarized light will be rotated dependent on the length of the, of the substance it travels through and the concentration. If I also know the length that's traveled through and the concentration, I can use these to work out um, whatever unknown I have available to me. So if I know the amount of rotation, if I know the specific optic rotation of the material, and I know the length of the material which is traveled through, then I can work out the concentration of that substance 
by it being the only unknown I have. So, further practical uses of polarization. It can be used for stress analysis. So if I look at uh, materials to see how much the polarized light has been impacted, so that means how much the light, the angle of the polarized light has changed, I can see when looking through certain cameras, I can identify areas which have undergone stress. Because quite often transparent materials, such as glass, they become optically active when they undergo stress conditions. That's one thing that can be used for. Uh, LCD screens, liquid crystal displays, as found on some TVs, also use this. What they do is it's discovered that nonatic liquid crystals are optically active. And even better than that, they're optically active, but this can be controlled by current passing through. So what it means is that you can control what and how much light passes through different filters by uh, controlling the amount of current, which means that you can control the different colors which pass through uh, different sets of filters. So this is what we use on a large scale, and each one of these situations we've seen in the diagram uh, can produce a small pixel which will have a range of different colors in perfect for displaying on a TV screen. So that gives you an overview of polarization and the methods or the tools we can use uh, polarization with.